So can you describe, like, let's take, for example, like a speech recognition system. Can you describe the differences of how you would think about training and deploying if it was going to like the cloud or a big desktop server versus a Raspberry Pi versus an Arduino? Yeah, and um, the theme again is size and how much uh, space you actually have on these systems. So you'll be thinking always about how how can I make this model as small as possible? Um, you know, you're looking at making the model probably in the tens of kilobytes for doing, you know, we have this example of doing speech recognition, and I think it uses like a 20 kilobyte model. So um, you're going to be sacrificing accuracy and a whole bunch of other stuff in order to get something that will actually fit on this really low energy um, device, but hopefully it's still accurate enough that it's useful. <laughs> right. So how do you do that? Like, how do you, how do you reduce the size without compromising accuracy? Can you describe like some of the, the techniques? Yeah. Um, so I actually just um, blogged about one uh, trick that I've seen used, um, but I realized I hadn't seen in the literature very much, which is where, um, you know, the classic going back to AlexNet, um, approach after you do a convolution in like an image recognition network, you often have like a pooling stage. So that pooling stage, um, you know, would either do average pooling or max pooling. And what that's doing is it's taking the output of the um, convolution, which is often the same size as the input, but with a lot more channels. And then it's taking blocks of like two by two um, values and it's saying, hey, I'm going to only take the maximum of that two by two block. Um, and so take four values and output one value or do the same, but do averaging. Um, and that um, helps with accuracy, but because you're outputting these very large um, outputs from the convolution, uh, that means that you have to have a lot of RAM because you have to hold the input for the convolution um, and you also have to hold the output, which is the same size as the input, but typically has more channels. Um, so the memory size is even larger. Um, so instead of doing that, a common sort of technique that I've seen in the industry is to use a stride of two on the convolution. So instead of having the sliding window just slide over one pixel every time as you're doing the convolutions, you actually sort of have it jump two pixels you know, horizontally and vertically. Um, and that has the effect of outputting the uh, same um, the same result as you would, or the same size, um, same number of elements that you would get if you did a convolution plus a sort of a two by two pooling. Uh, but it means that you actually do less compute and you don't have to have nearly as much kind of active memory um, kicking around. Um, Interesting. And, I, I had thought yeah. when the, the size of the model, you know, you, you, it was just the size of the model's parameters, but it sounds like you also, I mean, obviously you need some active memory, but it's hard to imagine yeah. that even could be on the order of magnitude of the size of the, the model, like the literally the pixels of the image and then the kind of intermediate results I guess, can be, can be bigger than the model? Yeah, I mean, well, that's kind of the nice thing about convolution is you get to reuse the weights um, in a way that you really don't with, like, fully connected layers. Um, so you can actually end up with um, convolution models, the activation memory, taking up a substantial um, amount of space. And I guess I'm also getting into the weeds a bit here because the obvious answer to your question is also uh, quantization, like taking these floating point models and just turning them into 8-bit because that immediately slashes all of your memory sizes by 75%. And what about, I mean, I, I've seen people go down to 4 bits or even 1-bit. Do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. There's been some really, really interesting work Um a colleague of mine, I actually, uh, again, I'll send on a link to the paper, um, but looked at, I think it's something about the Pareto optimal, like bit depth for ResNet is like four bits or something like that. Um, 
And there's been some really, really good research about um, going down to sort of four bits or two bits or even going down to sort of, you know, binary networks with one bit. Um, and the biggest challenge uh, from our side is that um, CPUs aren't generally optimized for anything other than like eight bit arithmetic. Um, so uh, going down to these lower bit depths, um, you know, requires some advances in the, uh, the hardware that we're actually using. If you're enjoying Gradient Descent, you might actually be interested in the main thing we do here at Weights and Biases, which is making tools to help with machine learning. If you're building models and you want to track the models that you build, or you want to track the data sets that go into the models you build, or you want to track the models that you deploy into production, you can do all that with Weights and Biases. And best of all, it's free for personal and academic use. Go check us out at WMB.com and let me know how it goes.